blustery day in 1883, Scotland's most eminent landscape painter stood watching the tide turning off the west coast. William McTaggart had captured these views many times before. But on this occasion, he began to envisage a very different kind of canvas. I've painted seascapes on the west coast of Scotland all my life. And I can just imagine as the sky darkens and the wind begins to get up, how McTaggart becomes more and more excited. Alone on the beach, surrounded by the elements, he conjures up a new image of Scotland, the image of a nation standing on the brink of enormous change. McTaggart called his painting The Storm. It captured not just the beauty, but the restlessness, the vulnerability, and the troubled spirit of Scotland. This was a time when a new generation of Scottish artists emerged who rejected tradition. They were bohemian, they were rebellious, and they were in search of a new way of seeing, a new way of creating art that would reflect the modern age. The last decades of the 19th century were a tempestuous period in the history of Scottish art. A time when the dual forces of tradition and reinvention wrestled for artistic supremacy. And Scotland's artists, refusing to be shackled by their past, travelled far and wide in search of inspiration. and dazzle does with a riot of colour, movement and light. Over four blistering decades, they would forge a modern art for a modern Scotland. An art that would challenge history. An art that would question conventions. An art that would burn fast and fiercely before it was consumed in the fire of the First World War. Glasgow. In the 1880s, this was the engine room of empire, a place teeming with life. An industrial boomtown where commercial success would soon fuel a new artistic awakening. Glasgow's merchants and industrialists were self-made men with money to burn. These tycoons who'd made their fortunes in the cotton, tobacco and shipbuilding trades, well, for them, collecting art was a new way to launder their identity, to clean the muck from out under their fingernails. And because they weren't from aristocratic stock, they didn't have huge inherited collections of art. So the walls of their spanking new Victorian palazzos looked decidedly blank. It was a very good time to be an artist in Scotland. It was against this backdrop that a dynamic group of Glasgow-based artists emerged, keen to breathe new life into Scottish art. This loose-knit band of kindred spirits would become known as the Glasgow Boys. You can see some of the key players here, decked out as great masters of the past at the Glasgow Art Club's Costume Ball, a sign, perhaps, of their self-confidence and intent. But proposing new ways of painting in Scotland was going to be a hard sell. 
This was the highly popular and officially sanctioned image of Scotland that the Glasgow boys were up against. These kind of highland panoramas had become a globally recognised trademark. Think Scotland, think the big country, the rutting wildlife, and a veil of mist turned tobacco colour by layers of gloopy varnish. So why change such a winning formula? Well, the point was that on the continent, artists had begun to move away from this kind of bombastic romanticism. They were less interested in making a monument out of the landscape and more intrigued by a sense of spontaneity, intimacy, a dancing glance of sunlight. The art of Scotland was beginning to look a little bit out of date, old fashioned. Artists were going to need to change with the times. The young James Guthrie would emerge as one of the pioneers of the Glasgow group. He was determined that their paintings would capture an authentic Scotland, its landscape, its people, its light. Guthrie struck out into the rolling lowlands in search of inspiration. He wasn't after dramatic views. He sought out intimate scenes, the mundane reality of everyday rural life. In its day, painting an objective, unsentimental portrait of a rustic labourer was seen as radical. Giving a farmer the air of dignity, making a painting of him that, that showed the respect and the commitment that you might when doing a portrait of a king or an aristocrat. Well, in Britain at least, that was still seen as a concept as controversial as today's pickled shark. It was a challenge to convention. To genuinely reflect rural reality, Guthrie embedded himself within a village community. A very progressive thing for a British artist to do at the time. During the 1880s, Coburn's path on the Berwickshire coast became his home from home. Other members of the Glasgow group joined him during the summer months. The unsuspecting village soon became a lively artist colony, with an artist lodger in almost every house. In painting after painting, the boys immortalised the villagers on canvas. Theirs is the Scottish landscape through a portrait lens, rather than a wide angle. And this unposed authenticity could only be achieved by getting out of the studio and sketching outdoors from life. The boys' enthusiasm for plein air painting coincided with new technological developments. Small tubes of paint and collapsible easels made working outside more practical than it had ever been before. Allowing the boys to carefully emulate the cool tones of the elusive Scottish sunshine. There's a great pleasure in painting outdoors because when you're no longer in the studio you get affected by lots of other things that are happening around you so in this evening the light is it's changing all the time, it's very soft, but there are little, little moments where it comes through the cloud and it highlights parts of the landscape. You can't imagine any of that. You can't imagine the changes that come across the landscape so suddenly. Painting outdoors was already popular in France. But as Guthrie's sketch shows, in the changeable Scottish weather it demanded considerable dedication. When winter set in and the other Glasgow boys returned to the warmth of their city studios, Guthrie doggedly stayed on in Coburn's path. 
One year he really struggled with a depiction of field workers sheltering from the rain and he got so frustrated with this composition that he put his foot right through the canvas. But he persevered, he pushed through it. And you know, painting's not always a picnic. And to get to the best paintings, you've, you've got to fight for them. He certainly understood that. Guthrie and the Glasgow boys were turning their back on many of the conventions in Scottish art. This boldness was one of the reasons Sandy Moffat was drawn to their work as a young student artist. For him, they set the benchmark against which his generation measured themselves. Sometimes when you look at these paintings from a, a 21st century point of view, they really they don't look that radical, but they were. Yeah, it's a complete break from everything the Victorians uh, preached, in a sense, as good art. The boys broke with that totally. It was a kind of gesture towards a more open and democratic way of painting. They're saying we're not um, snooty people, you know, hovering around the Royal Academy at that stage. We're saying we're identifying with farm labourers, we're identifying with a completely different way of, uh, with a different strata in society. And what do, what do you think that, for example, an artist like Guthrie coming here to, to, to the landscape of southeastern Scotland, what did he want to say by being here? Well, it seems that he definitely wanted to say something about Scotland hmm. and the way that uh, the, ru the rural communities existed and worked. For Guthrie, the subject matter and the way of painting that subject matter went hand in hand. Uh -huh. you know, it's about testing out these ideas you have of what paint might do, uh, applied in this way to this particular subject. The fact he did that changes the whole course of Scottish painting, literally overnight. While the Royal Academy in London celebrated titillating pastiches of classical mythology, James Guthrie was painting life as he found it and wiping the dirt of the real world from his boots. It was during one of these hikes that Guthrie stumbled across a young farm worker harvesting cabbages. It's the moment when, for me, one of the greatest paintings by any of the Glasgow boys was conceived. This is no romanticised image or stock character from central casting. Guthrie captures a dignity and an intensity that resonates across the centuries. No matter how many times I encounter the Heinz daughter, I always find that it's such a, an immediate and compelling image that it feels like the first encounter ever. You never look as closely at a painting as you do when you're sketching from it. It's not about copying, it's about immersing yourself in the artist's technique. It's an extraordinary feat of painting. And you can see across this whole canvas, Guthrie exploiting some of those important Glasgow boys' stylistic signatures, particularly his use of a square-headed brush. He's applying the paint in broad strokes. He's often emphasizing it with a palette knife, which gives the whole image a real thickness because it's been worked on layer upon layer. And yet, with the face of this young girl, he's changed styles. He's painted it smoothly, cleanly, and subtly, so that her presence emerges out of all this heavily laden brushwork, and it meets you with an extraordinarily personal effect. This is totally unsentimental. You really get the sense that you are encountering life as it was, face to face. The Hind's Daughter was a powerful new kind of Scottish painting, one that reflected the growing influence of continental ideas. In France, painters like Jules Bastien Lepage had achieved celebrity by capturing rural life with an almost photographic realism.
So while Guthrie remained in Scotland, another section of the Glasgow group travelled across the Channel, hoping to uncover the secrets of this new naturalistic style at its source. The leader of the pack was John Lavery, who discovered his talent for painting while working as a retoucher in a Glasgow photographer's studio. When Lavery arrived in grez sur loin a sleepy village 50 miles south of Paris, he stepped into an international artist colony. Full of bohemian types, desperate to get their taste of Lupage country. The locals must have eyed them sagely. They won't last long, they'd have thought. And many of them didn't. After their summer of rustic fun, most of them returned home, where parents, kindly but firmly, told them to get a proper job. But Lavery was here to take it seriously. He set up his easel on the riverbank and began a work that would help to make his name at home and abroad. Although some of this scenery does feel a bit familiar, maybe you'd stumble across something like this near Coburn's Path. For Lavery, the light, the smells, the sound of those French voices across the river would have felt still very exotic. And it drove him, I think, to take some chances, to create some new paintings that he perhaps would never have been moved to do in Scotland. Here in Grez, Lavery's painting would be transformed. Touched by French Impressionism, he developed a broader, looser style. And like a roving reporter, he was also experimenting with daring photographic composition and depth of field. The bridge at Grez was a popular subject. It had been painted numerous times before. But no one would capture it quite like Lavery. Perhaps he was inspired by a chance encounter with his hero, Bastien Lepage, who'd bestowed a few words of advice. Select a person, said Lepage sagely. Watch him and then note down everything you can remember. Never look twice. Lavery took his words to heart. His is a scene caught in the blink of an eye on a lazy afternoon. A roar blows a kiss to his sweetheart and slips by in a shimmer of heat. There for a fleeting moment and then gone. It was like nothing Lavery had ever painted before. France had stretched Lavery, introduced him to new ways of looking at life and capturing it on canvas. And when, after two formative summers, Lavery returned to Scotland, the taste of France lingered on in his painting. Lavery was determined to announce his return to the Scottish art scene with a bit of a fanfare. He began a series of studies for what he hoped would be a dynamic new canvas inspired by the newly invented sport of lawn tennis. Lavery was always a bit of a, an artist entrepreneur and he had a hunch that all those wealthy Scottish collectors with their fat wallets would be more seduced, more lured into buying paintings of themselves at play than any number of mud-spattered peasants. Lavery was taking on a very modern theme, the middle class at play, and working it up on a scale normally reserved for weighty historical subjects. It was a bold move. 
but Lavery was playing a clever game. The Tennis Party is a seductive painting. It invites you to walk through the open gate and join the company. And who wouldn't want to be introduced into this world? A place gilded in sunlight, blessed with ease. The Tennis Party would become the quintessential image of late 19th century middle-class Scottish life. And it made Lavery's name as a society painter. The mid-1880s marked a coming of age, not just for Lavery, but the whole Glasgow group. And it coincided with a high point for the city too. During the International Exhibition of 1888, the world came to Glasgow, which was now hailed as a great centre of art. The boy's work was showcased to an international audience. They were being talked about. They secured group shows in Europe and America. They had arrived. Scottish art had been forced to take a long, hard look at itself, at the people it chose to depict and the landscape it chose to identify with. The Glasgow boys were only gentle radicals, but there was one artist on the fringes of the group whose ambition reached even further. He is, in my view, one of the great unsung heroes of Scottish art. His name is Arthur Melville. Melville was an artist buccaneer. A man who took as many risks in his paintings as he did on his far-flung adventures. In the 1880s, he embarked on a treacherous two-year voyage across the Middle East, taking in Cairo, Karachi and Baghdad. Melville thought that he was journeying into the Arabian Nights, but in actual fact, he found his own heart of darkness. On his journey, he was pursued by bandits, robbed and even arrested as a spy. But the greatest adventure of his life lay in exploring the magic and wonder of watercolour. During his travels, Melville developed a unique style that the critics called blottesque. No other Victorian watercolourist could rival the simple, almost abstract power of these paintings. In the dazzling light of the Mediterranean, Melville perfected the challenging wet-on-wet -wet technique, which means using wet paint on wet paper. It's difficult because you have to work very fast and instinctively. Most amateur watercolour artists always try and keep control of their image. They work with very small brushes and they try and keep the whole image dry because once you've lost control of a watercolour painting, that's it, it's gone, you have to start again. Melville, however, was very brave. He would use big, thick brushes loaded with water and pigment and he'd splash them across the page from very early point. Now, watercolour images increasingly become more detailed, but Melville wasn't really pursuing precision. He wanted to capture light, atmosphere, mood. He'd often soak the whole page in water so that when he touched the surface of it with his brush, the pigment would be absorbed in a huge cloud of fresh colour. It's like when you drop a spot of ink onto blotting paper. He then might attack the page with a, with a sponge and he'd 
pull off some of the colour, using it like an eraser. And once all of that had died down, dried down, you'd only then begin to introduce the essential elements of detail with a darker colour. The results were mind-blowing. Strong, vibrant, sensual, exciting. This was a new kind of Scottish art, pushing watercolour to its limits. But what I find most astounding is the direction that Melville took his art in Paris in 1889. Paris was the 19th century world capital of art, nowhere else compared. And this was the year of the Exposition Universelle, a once in a decade opportunity to see the very best contemporary art. In a series of quite spectacular exhibitions, Melville was treated to a roll call of everyone who was anyone in the contemporary art world. Monet, Cézanne, Rodin, Paul Serousier, Émile Bernard, Paul Gauguin, all exhibiting in the same place at the same time. Now, surely that could not fail to impress. This was painting that wasn't about realism anymore. In fact, it was about the very opposite. It was about making the world around you appear a little bit unreal. Heady with this intoxicating display of revolutionary art, Melville headed for the newly opened Moulin Rouge, the hottest night spot in town. It would be a revelation. During the show, Melville did not stop sketching. His hand danced across the page, but the images that emerged seemed completely unrelated to the performance. They were unreal. Surreal. Melville was unleashing colour in a new and boldly thrilling way. For me, Melville's Moulin Rouge studies are some of the most exciting gems ever produced by a Scottish artist. These are pages from Melville's sketchbook, and here you've got a whole procession of Can Can Girls, which if you look at it right, you can see emerging out of the whole puddle of watercolour. And he hasn't tried to describe it precisely. He simply let the dribbles of his paint define the standing legs of the girls, which allow you, through all this maelstrom of brushwork, to imagine the other legs kicking up in the air. There's even the hand splodged down at the bottom left-hand corner of one of the onlookers, shrieking with delight. So in these watercolours, we've got Melville, an artist of the 19th century who isn't dictating to us what we're seeing. He's allowing your imagination to run riot. And I think that's expressed most particularly in this other watercolour. Who knows what's happening here? And if you spin the page round and round, it doesn't make any more sense. But what I can see is that as he's been slapping on these fantastic pure colours onto the paper, he's been holding the page up one way first, so the paint dribbles down the edge. He's then decided to hold the page another way as he's explored this yellow tone and the paint's dribbled this way. And then he's applied onto an increasingly wet piece of paper another tone and he's dribbled this fantastic ultramarine blue down the middle. And you can see where the paint has been so wet that it's mixed together into the green. He's turning the page round and round and you can hear the swirling can-can in the background. Melville was an artist ahead of his time. 
His premature death from typhoid fever aged just 49 cut short a brilliant career. Who knows what he could have gone on to achieve? While Melville's art was steeped in adventure and exoticism, one of the most successful artists of this generation remained resolutely at home, capturing his native land with an empathy and understanding that remains unrivaled. William McTaggart was a man apart. He was born into a Gaelic-speaking fishing community in Kintyre, on Scotland's remote west coast. His singular vision for Scottish art was inspired by the landscape of his childhood. One shaped by the constant exchange between rugged shore and raging tide. William McTaggart had grown up surrounded by fishermen, so he really understood the, the rhythms of the sea. He understood its power to sustain life, but also to take it away because his own son had died in a fishing accident aged only 21. So when McTaggart paints such places, he's actually describing a landscape that he has been immersed in all of his life. He's portraying his own people. McTaggart once said, it's the heart that's the thing. His painting is driven by emotion, a passion for spontaneous brushwork and a profound affection for his subject. But this landscape was experiencing one of the greatest upheavals in Scottish history, the Highland Clearances. As a boy, William McTaggart had watched hundreds of homeless Highlanders who'd been turfed off their land in order to make way for sheep, queuing on the quayside at Campbelltown. They were waiting for the ships that were going to take them to a new life in the Americas. It was an image William McTaggart would never forget. The clearances decimated the Gaelic-speaking population, threatening the language, culture and history that McTaggart had inherited. In the 1890s, the memories he had been harbouring all his life emerged in a series of highly personal canvases. They portrayed the arrival of Saint Columba in the 6th century, a pioneer of Gaelic culture in Scotland. And the sailing of the emigrant ships that swept waves of Gallic people away from their native land. This is a painting of a Gallic community. It's a portrait of that community as it's being torn apart and uprooted. And the very landscape seems to take it personally. And what strikes me when I look at these paintings up close is that the reason that amidst all this swirl of brushstrokes, it becomes quite hard to discern detail to pick out the figures is because for McTaggart, the community that lives here and the identity of the local geography, they're interchangeable. They're both implicated in an underlying narrative of hardship and loss. What I love though about McTaggart's work is that really 
It's all about heart. You know, these images, they, they, they breathe, they crash with a kind of tidal energy that was totally unique in Scottish art at the time. MacTaggart's elegy for a disappearing culture was deeply personal. But it resonated with the times. Across Britain, a new era was dawning, heralded by the sweeping changes of the Industrial Age. The Industrial Revolution had turned Scotland from a largely agricultural nation into one centred around its cities. Nowhere more so than its engine room, Glasgow. But a growing artistic movement felt this so-called progress was destroying the cultural life of the nation. And it was the artist's job to fight against this. The arts and crafts movement really believed that art was much more than just a commodity. They thought that art should be integrated into the very fabric of society for the benefit and the elevation of all. One Scottish institution that really embraced the new arts and crafts ethos was the Glasgow School of Art. The school was a forward-thinking, innovative place and one of the first in the world to admit women on the same terms as men. Margaret MacDonald and her younger sister Frances enrolled in 1890. Two talented and versatile young artists, they found themselves in just the right place at the right time. In the school's all-embracing creative atmosphere, the sisters developed their distinctive style across a vast range of mediums. From fabric and beaten metal to paintings and wall decorations. While they were at the School of Art, they were introduced to two like-minded students. Herbert McNair and a 25-year-old architect who was already standing out from the crowd, Charles Rennie Mackintosh. They soon became a close-knit group known to other students as the Four. The friends painted together. They partied together. Francis coupled up with McNair, Margaret with Mackintosh. Their lives became intertwined. The four began to devise a haunting new graphic style, one that was based on fluid, organic forms, sinewy tendrils, and the stylized shapes of flowers, plants, trees, and stems. They would meet in each other's studios and have discussions long into the night. And from out of their imaginations, they began to spin a whole new kind of imagery, one which, rather like them, was intense, intimate, provocative and sensual. These young souls were about to press a thorn into the comfortable, moral and also oh tasteful backside of Victorian convention. When the four first exhibited together, their elongated designs and ghoulish figures led critics to dub them the Spook School. A tension between flowering abundance and macabre collapse permeates everything they created. They're examining themes, allegories of love, purity and chastity, but not in a celebratory way. All of the designs and the watercolours and the drawings that I'm looking at seem to take that warm, comforting hug of femininity and motherhood and undermine it, threaten it with a sense of uncertainty. We're entering a kind of 
netherworld, a dream landscape that doesn't seem terribly welcoming. And across Europe there was, at this particular time, a real trend for a design aesthetic called Art Nouveau, which relied heavily upon motifs of elongated female forms and slender drawings of flowers and trees. But what you see when you're confronted by these images is that they're creating a style that was distinct and particular to this city. The look the four created and applied to a staggering array of work became known as Glasgow style. It was much more than arts and crafts with a Celtic twist. It was a new vision for Scottish art, a fusion of Celtic symbolism, traditional craft and contemporary design for the modern world. But it was Charles Rennie Mackintosh who would emerge as the talismanic figure of the group. Today, we remember him as an architectural genius. But for me, his brilliance lay in the fact that he would never be restricted to one discipline. He was an artist who sculpted space and created environments that immersed you in a total work of art. And nowhere did Macintosh achieve this more fully than at Hill House in Helensburgh, which he designed and built in the early 1900s for the publisher Walter Blackie. Hill House is striking in its simplicity. But when the sun comes out, and the shadows reveal the intricacy of Macintosh's design, you can really appreciate the sculptural quality of this building. It distills Scotland's architectural history into a structure that feels disarmingly original, unprecedented. It's frustratingly hard to capture in a sketch. I've been trying to draw this building and it's been a real struggle. All I've come up with is a sketch of a baronial Scottish castle. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I think that's right. You can see the baronial forms here. You see the gable, you see the tall chimneys, you see the random fenestration. These are typical Scottish qualities of vernacular architecture. When you say vernacular, what, what, what do you mean? Well, what you mean is that the, this is a de an architecture developed by people in Scotland, in, on Scottish buildings, and it owes very little to classical tradition. Uh -huh. yeah. But it's still something ancient, it's still something old-fashioned. Well, certainly between, say, the 13th century and the 16th century is w the roots of that style, the Scottish baronial style. It's a very pragmatic style. It adapts to the site, it adapts to the history, it changes through the centuries. It's not something that's um, static that's got set rules, that things must be placed in a certain way. So why did Charles Henry Mackintosh want to make a 20th century building look like a 13th century castle? I think for an artist like Mackintosh, again, looking to the past in order to leap forward was very important. And there are some aspects in the way of working of the Scottish baronial which are very congenial to the modernist view of an object. The idea that the object has its own life, that you, that you build pragmatically, that you allow the building to emerge with its own authenticity over a period of time. So he's, he's working like an artist or a sculptor making spontaneous decisions on site. Yeah, I think like some others in history, I don't think it's, it's too much to compare to Leonardo, to <laughs> Raffaele. He's an artist architect. Hill House is a bold modernist statement. But it's also a very personal and intimate home designed down to the smallest detail, with Walter Blackie and his family in mind. Hill House really does manage to encapsulate all the principles that Macintosh held dear. You've got tradition and reinvention and just a sprinkling of magic. 
Who would have believed that behind a facade that appears to be so austere, like a Scottish fortress, that on the inside it would be lyrical, magical, so unshackled by any kind of precedent? Throughout this building, nature is welcomed inside. Vertical oak beams suggest an internal woodland, and stenciled motifs creep up the walls like briars. It's a place of contrasts, where light and shade, colour and restraint combine to guide you from one room to the next. As if you're being led by a character from one of Blackie's fairy tales. At Hill House, Macintosh transforms a family home into one of Scotland's greatest works of art. It was also a labour of love. The creative kinship between Macintosh and his wife, Margaret MacDonald, flourished throughout the building. She created fabrics and wall decorations to complement his design. For the visionary architect, his wife was a soulmate, a steadying influence, and a lifelong collaborator. Macintosh was besotted with Margaret, but he was also entranced with her as an artist, and he once said, Margaret had genius, I have only talent. But what's certain is that here at Hill House, genius, talent, love, lust and wonder tremble together in a genuinely moving, creative union. Hill House is the moment when a true Scottish genius blossoms. Macintosh is now hailed as one of the pioneers of the modern movement. But at the time, his vision was largely misunderstood or simply ignored in Scotland. But his dedication to challenging tradition, to reinvigorating it and making it new, couldn't be silenced. And soon, another artist would insist that Scottish art belonged at the very head of the modernist avant-garde. J.D. Ferguson was one of a group of painters who succeeded the Glasgow Boys as the bright young things of Scottish art. They would become known as the colourists because of their vibrant palette. Early in his career, Ferguson established a highly saleable style. But for Ferg, this wasn't enough. He sensed the revolutionary possibilities of contemporary art. And there was only one place that offered the liberation, light and life he craved. Paris. Ferguson moved there in 1907. When Ferguson arrived in Paris, he declared, Ici commence la liberté. For him, Paris really was freedom. And he immediately ran off to find himself an appropriately squalid studio flat in Montparnasse. Ferguson found himself in the very crucible of modern art. Picasso was painting prostitutes. Matisse, like a wild beast. And André Durand had entered a dream world all of his own. Ferguson plunged into the city's social scene. He captured its elegant bohemians and intellectuals in a series of bold new canvases that totally transformed his art.
Ferguson loved Paris, and Paris loved him. What is extraordinary is that two years after moving here, in 1909, he's elected a societaire of the Salon d'Auton. This is the most progressive exhibiting society in Paris. You're elected onto it by your colleagues and contemporaries. So to have reached that position and have it recognised within two years is extraordinary. And that's why Ferguson, more than any other British artist, let alone Scottish, plays a part in the birth of modern art. So why in that short period was he esteemed to be worthy of membership of the society? What was he doing in treatment? You see an immediate change in his work when he arrives here. There's a series of street scenes of Paris, literally getting to know his, his, his new home. But also he had um, a great deal of interest in the faux, so-called fauve work of artists like Matisse and Durin. They showed at the Salon d'Automne in 1905. Their expressive brush strokes, their um, acidic colour were considered so savage that they were christened the beasts, the, the fauves by the critic Louis Vaucel. Um, and Ferguson is not only one of the first British artists to become aware of them, but to see their work very soon after it's painted. But more than that, to understand what they were doing, interpret it, and to make it his own. And that is what he's recognised for when he's ele elected a societaire. Establishing himself in Paris gave Ferguson the freedom to develop his paintings, his instincts, his ideas, in a way he could never have done back home. One of the reasons that Ferguson had flounced out of the Academy in Edinburgh was because he realised he was going to have to wait three years before painting a nude model from life. Now, in Paris, there was no such prudery. He painted from models, he painted his friends, his lovers, and increasingly, these canvases were less about capturing a likeness and more about celebrating what he defined as a kind of elemental femininity. Between 1907 and 1913, Ferguson would return to the female form again and again. These celebrations of womanhood, sexuality and the feminine spirit were more radical than anything being painted in Britain at the time. His glorious nudes would establish Ferguson as the first truly modern Scottish painter. And it was in Paris in 1913 that Ferguson's vision of powerful femininity was magically transformed into flesh in the form of dancer Margaret Morris. The attraction was immediate and enduring. But all too soon, Margaret had to return to London. And without her, Paris lost its luster. So, Ferguson headed south to the Côte d'Azur in search of more sun, more colour. He rented a cottage on the little-known Cap d'Anty. And he wrote repeatedly and desperately, begging Margaret to join him. My dear flapper, I've taken a little villa at Antibes. It's practically an island and quite quiet. You don't need to dress at all. I mean, dress up. If you don't come down, you're a rotter and no sport at all. At first, Meg resisted, but in the end, well, you would, wouldn't you? It was, she said, just how a perfect honeymoon should be, but seldom is. Together, they reveled in the sun, sea, and languid pleasures of the good life. With Margaret Morris as his muse, Ferguson finally completed a work he'd been wrestling with for three years. 
It's a painting about love, vitality, and a primal lust for life. Ferguson would call it les eus, which means the healthy ones. It's a monumental canvas that captures what it feels like to be modern, continental, and Scottish all at the same time. In this painting, Ferguson really does manage to capture the spirit of the age. I mean, this was a time of dazzling upheaval and change. And Scottish art was part of that bigger picture. It was bold. It was willing to defy convention. It was really immersed in the ideas that were shaping the avant-garde. So this is a time when Scottish art had a particular and very distinct identity, one that had been shaped by its history and by its heritage, but also by its wanderlust, the willingness of Scottish artists to go out there and meet the world, to evolve and to reinvent. The reason that Scottish art matters for me, it's not because it's so unique. It's because you can see in a painting like this, it has always been profoundly engaged in that, in that great collaborative process that is our common story, that is the history and the future of art. The blissful time that Ferguson spent with Margaret Morris in the south of France was not to last. One morning, Meg looked out towards the sea and murmured, nothing can ever be as perfect as this. Shortly afterwards, she went for a stroll and pausing beneath the pines, she started to paint the Antibes lighthouse when a gendarme approached. He tapped her on the shoulder and said, Miss, it's forbidden. But why? asked Meg innocently. Because of the war. It was August 1914, and all the innocence and gaiety had come to a violent end. Many of Scotland's artists were called away to serve their country. And when they returned, if they returned, it was to find a nation irrevocably changed. In the fractured post-war age, all the beauty, all the life, all the vigour they had once painted would feel like something from a bygone era. In the years that were coming, this world would need its artists more than ever. It would need them to create new ways of seeing. It would need them to make sense of a broken world in which all those conventions, all those precedents, all the traditions that we once held dear lay bleeding in the rubble. 